Hi everybody, this is another one of our series of the Tell Me in 10 talks for the residents who are currently working hard under COVID conditions to help you to learn along the way. So the topic today is imaging of cervicalgia and uh, what I'm going to try and discuss with you is a few things we look at on imaging while we're addressing and assessing cases which have cervicalgia which is essentially neck pain. The overview of this talk is this, is when we think about neck pain, cervicalgia, it is primarily thought of as being from a neurogenic cause, which could be due to some problem or abnormality with the cord or the roots. And here we're trying to determine what is impinging upon the cord of the roots. Uh, when we think of what can be impinging or causing mass effect upon the cord and the roots, we think of the disc, uncovertebral hypertrophy, facet osteophyte complexes, facet cysts, and things like um ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament or OPLL and then we look at the cord or the root to determine whether it's abnormal or normal in other words if it has edema, myelomalacia, neurodegenerative change or some neoplastic problem. When we see what's impinging we want to know how much it's impinging. The next cause of pain that we think of is facetogenic pain and here the primary concern is of whether somebody has facet arthrosis, facet arthrosis with edema or with a perifacet cyst. The way we're going to look at the rest of this talk is we're going to break it up into looking at radiographs. Um, we're looking at some dynamic views uh, on X-ray and CT and on looking at the MRI. So the frontal cervical radiograph forms a good place to start looking for your cause of pain. And here primarily the area to look very carefully at is the uncovertebral joints. So if we zoom up here, you can see the lateral aspect of the end plate, superior end plate of the vertebral body has got a small little lip and that lip where the arrow goes is the uncovertebral hypertrophy and that's a common cause for impingement upon the foramen and then upon the nerve root that's exiting. Other things you'd look for are cervical ribs and some destructive osseous lesions. The lateral radiograph is also a great place to start looking and here we start out by looking at the alignment of the vertebral bodies by looking at the anterior posterior spinal lines as well as the spinal laminar line. We look at the intervertebral disc heights, which are a good indicator of the presence or absence of degenerative disc disease. We look at end plate spondylosis, which is essentially these small little osteophytes or spurs that happen at the end plates, which could then cause uncovertebral hypertrophy and impingement. And finally, we look at the facet joints uh, to see if there's any facet arthrosis. The real winner in all these is the oblique view. And here, when you take a left oblique view, you're essentially looking at the right foramen. And when you look at right oblique view, you're looking at the left foramen. And the important view about these views is they help you to look at the uncovertebral joints and at the foramena. So here you can see a nice view of the foramena. And when you look at the inferior aspect of the foramena, that's essentially where you see uncovertebral spurring. And when you look at posteriorly, that's where you see the facet arthrosis. Now, between these two vertebral bodies, you can see that in the mid level, there is already some uncovertebral hypertrophy and facet arthrosis, and as a result of which, there's deformation of that foramen. And this is a nice way for you to look to see if there's bony foramenal stenosis. One more thing that radiographs offer us are dynamic views. You can do this with CT and MR as well, but radiographs are always a good place to start and to look for gross movement abnormalities. So flexion and extension views with a neutral help to determine whether there's anterior or posterior translation of vertebral bodies over each other, which could lead to dynamic impingement. And you can see this oftentimes a bit better on CT as well. You can reconstruct this, look at this in multiplanar reformations, etc. And here you can see how there's increased retropulsion of C4 over C5 in extension as opposed to flexion and neutral positions. Once you've looked at the radiographs uh, and uh, to some extent the CT, the next thing we move on to is looking at the discs for canal stenosis. Now the sagittal MRI images are obviously great places to look for loss of disc height as well as some broad based disc bulging to see that there's contour abnormality or abutment or impingement upon the cord and uh, this is obviously very very helpful it's also helpful for us to look to see if we have um, a soft tissue disc or there is end plate spondylosis associated with it but what we really get from the axial images here is essentially a greater piece of information on the actual disc abnormality and here we are looking at a few different things and the disc geometry so here we're looking to see if there is a presence of an abnormal abnormal contour in which case we see convexity of the disc posteriorly and here we're trying to determine whether something is a bulge, herniation, protrusion, extrusion, or sequestration. And you can see in the table, on the figure just to the right of the, of the text, 
um, the variations in that appearance. Once you do that, the next thing you want to do is locate this disc herniation or abnormality. Is it uh, central, in which case it lies close to the midline? Is it in the lateral recesses when it's a little further out? Or is it far laterally when it is in the foramen? And that again tells you what part of which structure is being impinged. The third thing that we talk about is whether the, what is the size of the disc. So if it's mild, moderate or large, um, and that's another helpful indicator. So anytime we look at a disc, we're trying to determine A, if there's a disc contour abnormality, where is it located? Is it in the midline? Is it paramedian? Is it in the lateral recess or is it in the foramen? And then we want to determine if it is mild, moderate or large. Another thing that a lot of people are interested in looking at is to determine whether a disc is hard or soft. And here looking at the sagittal T1 and T2 weighted images is helpful because you can see the disc contour of the vertebral body very nicely. Um, in this case, and you can see that the disc is separate from it, and therefore this is a soft disc. Another image that's particularly helpful is the one on the bottom left, uh, which says C4-5, um, which is a gradient echo image, which is a special kind of sequence which happens very fast. Um, it's prone to a few more artifacts, but when you see bright signal within the disc, um, as you do centrally over here, you can be reasonably sure that this is a soft disc. Uh, CT is obviously helpful because it shows you the bony contour and can discreetly separate the disc component from the bony component when you look in the soft tissue windows. On the other hand, let's look at one disc below, which is the C5 Slicks disc. Here you can see there's advanced disc height loss. You can see that there's some irregularity of the end plate, uh, which is end plate spondylosis. You can see on the gradient echo image that the disc does not have any of that bright signal and you can see on the CT image that there's end plate spondylosis and narrowing. And then this becomes what we would call a disc osteophyte complex or broad based disc with mild end plate spondylosis. So this is sort of what we would do when we look for discs. We want to identify if there's an abnormality on the sagittal images, compare it with others. We look for contour abnormalities. We look for where the contour abnormalities are. We look for how big they are. And then finally, we try to determine whether it's purely disc or it's disc along with end plate spondylosis. That being said, there are some other areas which you can have problems with, and this is basically a situation where you can have ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, which could lead to massive narrowing of the uh, canal. And here you can have some high signal within this on the gradient echo images as well, because it's basically marrow signal that's extending into that. Once you identify that there is some element of canal narrowing or mass effect on the cord, it's important to look at the cord signal to determine if it's just subtle syrinx-like signal whether it's a more diffuse signal abnormality, whether it's more focal with expansion and edema, or whether you have a tumor or mass-like uh, change, or you have myelomalacia, as you have in this last case where the cord is markedly thin. So when it comes to cord signal abnormality, we're trying to determine whether it's pure cord edema or it's myelomalacia. Uh, cord edema is acute. Uh, myelomalacia tends to be more chronic. The cord will be more thinned when you have myelomalacia, and then you have focal versus diffuse abnormalities. Now, when you have cord edema, remember to look at the T2 weighted images. Do not assess cord edema on the gradient echo images. And there are some fairly standard edema patterns and what these edema patterns mean on axial images, but this is beyond the purview of this current talk. So just remember that when you do see cord edema, look at the axial images and then try and figure out what pattern it is so you can determine what cause of it is. Uh, so when it comes to canal narrowing, we want to know if there's a mass effect on the canal, what is causing it, how bad is it, and if the cord is affected. Moving from the canal to the foramen, the foramen, another important thing to remember here is while we do a lot of gradient echo imaging to look at the foramen and to look at the cervical spine because they give us really nice thin section images, they are also images that are prone to more artifact and therefore they tend to expand the bone in what we call a blooming artifact and cause more narrowing of the foramen. So therefore, you would see that the foramenal narrowing is often overestimated on a gradient echo image. So if we look at the right image, which is T1, look at the middle image, which is the gradient echo, and we look at the left image, which is T2, you can see that the gradient echo image shows much more narrowing of that left foramen as compared to the right. So be careful when you're calling foramenal narrowing on gradient echo images. Foramenal narrowing can also happen from lateral recess and foramenal disc herniations and uh, end plate spondylosis. And another interesting way to look at the foramen is to get something that is called oblique sagittal images. So you can do this with CT when you reconstruct the images, or you can do this on MR when you acquire them. And this is just like looking at your oblique cervical spine radiograph, and you can see the uncovertebral spurring and the facets really nicely, 
just like you did in the previous study and when the radiograph we discussed earlier. And you can see this very nicely on CT as well when you do the oblique reformatted images. Now, here's an example of a patient where you have uh, somebody with facet arthrosis. You can see a very, very tiny facet cyst there which is causing impingement on the nerve root. And then you can see this person in a few a month later where the cyst has increased significantly in size and still further where you can see that that cyst remains relatively persistent uh, large. So these can facet cysts, so when you have facet arthrosis, you can have facet cysts that can impinge upon the, uh, upon the nerve roots and you should look carefully for that. Rarely we can have vascular abnormalities, so you have situations like this where you have a very um, spiraled um, or a looped vertebral artery which can then loop into the foramen and cause some narrow. So when we're thinking of root impingement, remember MRI is excellent. Gradient echo images will overestimate foramenal narrowing. Look for uncovertebral spurring and facet spurs that can cause foramenal narrowing and impingement. Uh, these you will see on oblique reformatted images often very nicely. Uh, remember that there are odd structures like facet cysts that can come up and occasionally vascular anomalies. Last but not least, let's talk about the pain generator of the facets. The facets themselves can get degenerated, can be normal, can have facet osteophytes and uh, these can obviously cause pain and impingement by either having facet arthrosis or by impingement upon the neurological structures. Facet arthrosis typically causes more axial neck pain and uh, this obviously can be graded very nicely on MRI uh, in terms of whether you have mild, moderate or severe facet arthrosis. Um, so you can look at these on the axial images as well as the sagittal images. But one of the nice things that we see with facet uh, edema when you have patients with axial neck pain um, is oftentimes you'll see facet edema. And when you see facet edema, one can be pretty sure that that facet is usually the cause of symptoms. Although remember when you see facet edema that it's not always degenerative and you should look to make sure that you're not missing a case of traumatic edema, uh, inflammatory disease or infectious disease. Um, Last but not least, um, just to determine about facet disease, we can uh, see these well on MRI, on axial and gradient echo images, as well as on CT. Perifacet edema is a good way to look for whether facets could be symptomatic or not. So what we've done in the last 12 minutes or so is we've talked about most aspects of cervicalgia, which we can assess on imaging with X-ray, CT and MRI. We've talked about canal, canal narrowing, what are the structures that narrow the canal, what do they do and how we can describe them. We've talked about looking at the cord itself. We've talked about the foramen, what narrows them and how we can assess the foramen using various different techniques. And then we've talked about the facets, how we can grade facet arthritis and how we can also then look for facet edema, but we must be careful not to miss things like infection or inflammation rather than just being degenerative facet edema. So with that, I'll go ahead and end this and wish all of you a safe time at your work. I hope you've learned from this. Um, stay well and keep up the great work. Thank you.